everyone. So I want to start with a small confession. Um, notwithstanding, as, as Jim mentioned, my affiliation to the Centre for Workplace Futures and my very deep affection for um, the Centre for Future Work, I have to admit to you all, I'm a bit sick of the conversation about the future work. I don't know if any of you are with me here. I mean, it is absolutely ubiquitous, is it? There are literally thousands of articles written about it all the time. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it's because I've got small children, so I've got a five-year-old and a nine-year-old, and they're sort of finding their place in the world and, and working out, you know, what they love, um, ideas of justice, ideas of change. And you read these articles, and there's tend to be a quite snide kind of tone about certain professions that simply won't exist in the future. Or indeed, a very high level, a suspiciously high level of precision about the likelihood of those occupations existing in the future. For instance, my kid is really into acting, um, so I thought just for a lark I'll look up you know, the calculator of how likely acting would exist as a profession. The answer, 37.4. Point four. I mean, if it was 37, obviously it would be a good choice, but point four, no, no, no point going there. Also, interestingly, they said the one, one, one of four professions that would not disappear due to automation, for sure, was historian. Now, I trained as a historian, and I can tell you that's, uh, that's actually not true. Okay, so um, I think it is worth just considering and stepping back why there is such a frenzy of future of work talk and why we don't tend to talk about other things with that same sort of reverence and fascination. So we don't sort of have big heated conversations about the future of taxation or the future of sport or the future of parenting. And, you know, I wonder, I wonder why that is. Um, I tend to think, actually, that asking what is the future of work is probably not a helpful question, or rather because it sort of imports a range of assumptions. One is that it kind of sets us up as spectators rather than participants in the process of what work is. It kind of accepts that the rules of work, the priorities for the kind of work that is done, the distribution of power between employees and employers, that somehow these are all given, that, that work is a thing rather than a relationship. Um, it's interesting that like in a period of like really intense technological change, like around the middle of the last century, there was not a lot of future of work talk. Uh, people weren't sitting in a passive kind of way saying, hmm, what is the future of work? There was a sense of what the function of society was and uh, that technology and human beings would be organised to that end. Um, I guess the other thing about sort of what is the future of work as a question is that it tends to divert our attention towards moments of dramatic disruption and dramatic change um, rather than gearing our attention towards more subtle changes, so ways in which technology can weaken rather than break employment relationships. Um, so rather than sort of answer the question, what is the future of work, I'm going to propose, and it's not inconsistent with what Jim has said, that actually there are two more interesting and kind of fertile questions we should be asking ourselves in this moment. One is, how might people use technology to further their own interests? So how can technology be a tool for concentrating power? And secondly, what kind of society do we want? <laughs> so how can we use technology to achieve that? How can we see technology very much as a servant rather than a master of human beings? So I'm going to have a go at answering those two questions. <laughs> um, there, I should say there's a lot of overlap uh, and, and similarity and outlook um, in, between what I and what Jim said. So let's just start with the question about the concentration of power. Um, one of the most dramatic and talked about ways in which technology uh, is concentrating power is also the one that Jim has mentioned, and that's the advent of the gig economy, um, which another way of putting that is the bypassing of labour law. So, as Jim said, you know, we've very much been here with the gig economy before, um, platform employers, and it's not obviously just Google, there's a lot of attention on the food delivery services and the transport services, but these platforms now exist across the spectrum of um, forms of work. One that I've looked in particular is um, care work, so platforms for the provision of disability and aged care and childcare. So we have um, forums like Better Caring and Care.com that provide these. Um, they operate on the basis that workers are employee uh, independent contractors, so they don't get any award wages, they don't get any leave, they don't get any superannuation, they don't get other employer entitlements, so they can't join a union. So the place I look to, to sort of think about what that system looked like en masse is the 19th century and much of the 20th century, and we had a whole uh, 
sphere of, of human endeavour that was governed by those conditions, by pure contractual arrangements without any statutory limits on the hours of work, wages, leisure time, etc. And that was domestic service. Um, one in three, 120 years ago, one in three women worked in domestic service. It's quite a remarkable, it was the single largest uh, form of female employment um, in the 19th century. And the consequences of working without any restrictions were, I guess you might say, fairly predictable. So wages were very low, on average less than half the minimum wage for men. Um, hours were excessively long and elastic, typically 14 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Wages were often paid in kind, so through, through board and food rather than in cash. Wages could be paid, um, or sometimes not at all, or they could be paid yearly, and they could be paid to your mother. So um, <laughs> this work involved virtually no career progression. It was overwhelmingly perceived to be undesirable. And most, ch most women, when they had the chance to take another kind of job in teaching, nursing, working in a hospital, for instance, did so. Um, so I don't think we need to fantasise about what the potential for domination um, looks like in the future. We can look backwards and kind of get a sense of the contours of what happens when you remove those kind of um, protections. However, I think we can go further too, uh, thinking about domination and technology, by thinking about this idea of the scored society. So um, Jim mentioned this in his speak, talk too, this idea of... Um, the quantification and instrumentalisation of people's reputations, giving, giving star ratings, for instance, to people. Um, these are being used increasingly uh, in work, and not just platform work, but they're also being used across different spheres of life. Um, now, there's always been, modernity's been built around the idea of having some level of transferability of your accreditation to do a particular skill, but we're not talking about that, we're talking about something much more general, um, which is your, in a sense, close to being your level of compliance across all spheres of life. So technology is being developed that uh, will enable a mutually reinforcing architecture of surveillance to be built. And this is surveillance that flows between employers and governments. Um, the data that is, in general is being over-collected and in general it's being under-protected. Um, and the algorithms being used to analyse this data are being used in highly opaque ways and in, at all stages of the employment relationship. So at the level of um, selecting an applicant, um, algorithms are applied, and not simply to the documents that you have provided to your potential employer, but in fact your entire digital footprint. Um, the way algorithms work, of course, is by correlation of data rather than causation. So there's a very different kind of reasoning um, that's being applied here. And potentially the data sets being used are extremely broad indeed. So um, potentially your financial data, um, other publicly available data such as uh, legal proceedings, who your contacts and associates are, whether you're of childbearing age, whether you play games, whether your friends and associates do. Um, the, the real sort of advanced end of this is uh, it was the fintech, so the financial technology and the prop tech property technology industries. And these are, are areas that provide alternative credit scores, which can be obviously applied in an employment context. Um, and there is, in, in Kenya, where there's very little uh, data protection, there are now startups that um, actually offer loans based on um, an app which uploads the entire contents of a prospective customer's phone to US-based service for data analysis. And loan decisions are made on the basis of the data from the customer's address book, their phone records, their location data, their SMS records, whether they organise their phones on the basis of their friends' first names and last names. Um, the, the potential for all this to take us in a highly regressive and deeply discriminatory directions doesn't really need um, spelling out. Obviously, the, the data that these algorithms crunch through um, are the data that is given. So if there's discriminate, discriminatory associations in the data, then that's going to be what's spat out at the other end um, by the algorithms. Um, we don't need to have, really think too much about what it might mean for an employer who is in a um, situation trying to maximise their bottom line um, to avoid uh, a potential applicant who is of childbearing age and is a woman. Um, and that for that process to be handled entirely opaquely without any uh, uh, transparency about the basis of that decision. Um, so as Jim mentioned too, technology of course being used to manage workers within the work relationship. Um, at the moment we have a kind of like dystopian utilitarian theme park going on in Amazon warehouses. So um, I may as well just speak about that because it provides such a like, vivid crystallised example of um, some of the potential for uh, over-concentrated power. 
um, biometric wearables being uh, required to be worn by staff. Um, these don't just tell them where they need to, um, the pickers they're called, so the items that they need to pick to be shipped. Um, they guide their hands using sort of vibration technology, so actually making them like a kind of human robot. Um, and also they course report on non-productive activities like going to the toilet, like scratching. Um, <laughs> so the use of biometric wearables, again, I'm now doing the thing I just was complaining about before and quoting some sort of skyrocketing um, thing into the future. But anyway, 500 million bio wearables by 2021, according to the uh, report I read. But we don't need to get hung up on the detail. The point is the potential of these is very, very large. Um, Workers in Amazon warehouses are similarly, it, their work is kind of gamified, so they're given points, um, which actually of course is money, but they are docked points for failing to keep up with the machine, for taking toilet breaks, for arriving late. Um, they're kept in a state of constant movement, which also has a kind of effect on their ability to potentially unionise and to meet with other human beings. Um, another really interesting thing I learned was that the, the items they're required to pick are not ordered in a way that is logical to the human brain. They're ordered in a way that makes it most convenient for the machine. So this is kind of like disorienting effect on space that require, that means that the worker is, can't even use their senses to gain some mastery of their environment. They're, they're like required to just stare at the app and do precisely what the app tells them to. Um, and of course, the highly punitive set, a regime around arriving on time and people getting transported to the factory. So people having to pay to take the bus um, 10 pounds a day, um, which is more than an hour's wage, <laughs> and some workers, and of course you get docked money if you're late and there's no other way to get there. So some workers are now taken to um, sleeping in tents near the warehouse um, in winter temperatures, where the you know, temperature is below zero, um, and doing it for some time because they can't afford the risk of, of um, paying the money and or missing out on uh, being late for work. Um, so this is all very dramatic and it's very dystopian and it's very alarming, but we should also be thinking about the less dramatic instances that are um, extant in Australia today. Um, uh, the union I work for represents um, home care workers and they are directed to their different locations that they go to over to see um, by an app. And, uh, you know, in some way, of course, this is very convenient. Um, it potentially has great convenience that comes with calculating travel time via the app. Um, However, the app is designed in a way that when something goes wrong, someone has a car accident, or someone is late, or someone needs extra time toileting, there's no way to communicate that information via the app. So you have to do all your paperwork at home, work out whether there's been a mistake through underpayment, then sit on the phone for hours to communicate to the company. So this is a sort of very subtle thing about the way the app is programmed. It could easily work as, you know, the, the metaphor I like to think of is like, te technology can be like a dinner table. It can be this, facilitating thing that allows communication, or it can be a one-way mirror. It can be purely to sort of surveil and control and allow no feedback in the other way. Um, that, that use of technology as a distancing mechanism is happening all the time, everywhere. And I'm really happy to hear about Jim's plans for um, getting some a rich kind of empirical picture of how it's actually rolling out in workplaces now. Um, another like very subtle one is around uh, automated rostering, um, and automated payroll, like these things seem like obvious, you know, advances, right? So we don't have this, you know, burdensome administration that's now taken up by the robot. However, it means if there's a mistake or you've got a query, you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily make the app answer back. There's not a human being to talk to on the other end of the phone when there's a problem. And so there's a sort of deeply insidious alienating effect that comes from that too. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the impact of um, ratings in the gig economy and uh, certainly endorse everything Jim has said there. Um, effectively, you know, a worker's ability to get future work um, becomes contingent on ratings that are made in a wholly uh, one-sided way. I know in Uber there is, they do allow ratings on both sides, but many of the care platforms that I've looked at, they absolutely don't. It's only um, the only ratings that are allowed by the customer of the worker, um, and there's no independent dispute resolution process, um, so that rating could be based on, you know, fictitious fact, you know, facts that didn't occur or discriminatory reason. There is simply no recourse, and that uh, reputational damage is potentially permanent in the sense there's no mechanism for um, ratings to be removed from the internet. And um, you don't realise that it's happened either, anyway. Yes, that's right. It can happen without you even realising yeah, exactly. Black. Yeah, and the platforms themselves take no responsibility for the most part for uh, law, uh, dishonest reviews. They don't um, provide any transparent process for adjudication. 
So, um, needless to say, scoring systems, they don't just uh, evaluate behaviour, they also modify it. So, you know, everyone's heard of the idea of the panopticon, that we kind of act differently if we think we're being watched. Um, similarly, if we feel like we're being rated all the time, and we are, <laughs> um, it's likely that we are likely to modify our behaviour and, and behave in a more low-risk way. Um, there will be many uh, you know, forms that may take, but I would suggest at minimum you are less likely to join a union or do something that you perceive will be, uh, think will be likely to be perceived as difficult to a future employer or indeed any other person who might be judging you. Um, this sense of kind of convergence of these different forms of ratings happening um, is, you know, very, very alarming. I'm sure everyone's probably heard about the, um, the Chinese government's plans to create a general social credit score. Um, we're already seeing the direct consequences of that. Apparently, uh, over 12 million people in China were placed on domestic travel bans, effectively banning them from traveling, traveling either by plane or by train. Um, we also have in Australia an, a national biometric matching capability. Um, which uh, has, has just been rolled out and for which I understand the protections are um, extremely minimal. So leaving aside the side of ratings, um, there's also another, I think, insidious effect of um, technology potentially in the way we are as a society, and that is the elevation of efficiency above all other values. Um, so technology tends to prioritise what can be quantified and quantify it. Um, it tends to give privacy to things that are consistent with computational thinking and be not very good at handling things that a lot of human beings, we all value a great deal that aren't susceptible to utilitarian analysis. I'm thinking about um, things that have to do with, with trust and continuity of relationships and moments of vulnerability and um, things that make us human. <laughs> um, these are very poor uh, at being translated into um, utilitarian concepts that are the fuel for how um, digital systems of governance work. Um, I would just again point to, um, to, to, as a sort of exemplification of this sort of clash of um, sensibilities, the gig economy in care. Um, you know, the, you don't need research to know that uh, what a high quality caring relationship looks like. It tends to be characterised by continuity and high levels of trust and the person genuinely caring for you, um, which takes time. It's not really something you can do efficiently. Um, it's like playing, you know, Mozart's quartet efficiently. You kind of, you can play it three times as fast. It doesn't get any better. It probably gets worse. Like, <laughs> whereas <laughs> when you, um, you, you subsume uh, something that it is better in a way, the slower it is done because it's about, you know, well, care is like a calling of attention from one human being to another. Um, the gig economy, however, is run by this fuel of ratings. Ratings don't get made until relationships are over, until they are severed. So it basically demands churn um, to make the system run, um, notwithstanding the fact that there is no uh, way of engaging the quality of relationships. So it seems to me like by looking to you know, the care.com as the future of care, you are actually creating a system that by its very design, uh, it is based on worker fungibility, it's based on turnover, you are creating a system that is far worse, that is going to lead necessarily to higher levels of alienation and lower levels of care. It doesn't seem like a great idea to me. Um, so obviously the idea of uh, alienation is not new. You know, Marx spoke about alienation, um, workers being alienated from the product that they make, their act of production, their species essence, and from other workers. It seems to me technology has this immense potential to deepen alienations, to keep them, keep workers moving, separated from each other, disorient them from their working environment, um, and um, yes, exercising a sense of control. So, um, as I've tried to say, potential technology can be used to concentrate power to an immense degree. Um, and when we get to a stage where everything is trapped and either at work or out of it, um, that these, the data that is collected has the potential to um, deeply affect your ability to get work, to get an education, to get access to housing, to get access to credit. I mean, imagine the point where we get Facebook is linked to your credit score, or is like, like where your, your um, interest rate gets determined by your contacts on Facebook. Um, we can basically see the end of social mobility. We see the, the idea of a society where we create a framework where everyone has a chance to flourish and fulfill their human potential. That is going to be deeply, um, deeply compromised by that sort of scenario. 
So the risk too is, pol is political paralysis, right? The risk is um, that somehow uh, this idea of computational thinking affects our politics too. We start to similarly think, okay, so good decisions are made when you just have enough data, um, rather than uh, an idea of, no, we actually have it in a priori way. It's not, it's not established by data, it's established by values. We have an idea of the good society, um, and we want to realise it. So I'm probably running out of time, I'm going to briefly... Five minutes, okay, five minutes for the kind of society we want. <laughs> so, uh, the sort of dominant idea of freedom that structures our society really is one that sanctifies individual choice. It's this idea of kind of freedom from coercion, freedom to choose what you want, buy what you want, amuse yourself in the way that you want, and freedom from discrimination too. Um, however, the kind of picture I painted earlier, I think can show that we could have those kinds of negative freedoms, but still be substantially unfree. Um, so I, as I said, am a historian, so I like to look back to the past for different ideas of freedom as sort of inspiration for sort of where we might go now. Um, and uh, I'm very taken by the idea of freedom that was advanced by the British idealists in the late 19th century. Um, T.H. Green was the uh, prominent philosopher in that group and his thinking really heavily influenced the um, nation builders in Australia in the 20th century that led us to the harvester decision and the minimum wage and the range of uh, the arbitration and conciliation uh, infrastructure that, that set up the nation. Um, but I think the ideas of freedom are just worth remembering and thinking about how we might translate them into our 21st century challenges. So they had an the idea of freedom that was positive. It wasn't just non-interference. It was freedom meant the idea, the right to self, sorry, to fulfillment and self-development the ability to engage in mutual support of other people and connection with others. It demanded that you not be in poverty. It demanded that you get an education. It demanded that you had the right to access um, and enjoy and tend to public space. Um, to get that kind of freedom requires state intervention because if your wages are in unlimited competition, you cannot be truly free. Um, if your life is subject to relentless and permanent examination, you cannot be truly free. So imagine if we use technology to cement that idea, to actually use, not just to you know, limit wage theft, as, as Jim says, but also to sort of really cement the idea of a living wage, a fair go in relation to education, um, in relation to all the things that are necessary for a flourishing life. Um, one of the obvious places to start in terms of policy um, is, is care work. You know, we still live in the long shadow of the 19th and 20th century in the undervaluation of that work. It was done for all of Australia's history by women on an unpaid, on an unpaid basis, um, where they were expected to receive you know, spiritual and moral rewards and not financial <laughs> rewards. <laughs> and, um, and then pretty soon after that, it was swamped by the private market, by, by ideas of marketisation which similarly drove down, down wages low. Um, I think if we placed care at the centre of our vision um, and thought about rewarding it properly, we would, uh, we would do well. Um, I think we also need to think very broadly about what care work looks like. Um, one of the groups that we represent at United Voice are security guards. You might not think of them as a caring kind of workforce. I think... Serco. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another big part of this picture too, um, outsourcing and uh, that dimension of service work for sure. Um, but let's also think about like the difference between machine surveillance versus human surveillance. Now, the famous Oxford Martin study put security guards, what was it, 84% chance of computerizability. Well, I have to tell you, you know, I know uh, one security guard that I've met, I have a pleasure to meet in the context of my work. Um, her name is Mary Moles, and she was the security guard at the magistrate, the, the Hobart Magistrate's Court for 20 years. And she's a very small woman. She's got grey hair, she's got this deep gravelly voice, and she was amazing. She could soothe the most powerful, the most intimidating offenders. She knew every single person in that court. Everyone greeted her by name, the judge, the lawyers, the prisoners, the prisoners' families. Um, and she was able to diffuse conflict simply through the depth of her relationships with people. So court users would say of her, um, when I had to make multiple court appearances with my son, she was the one thing that made it easy. You know, she knew women who had come in who had uh, suffered domestic violence and they were in again and again and again. She comforted them and she knew their story. No, cubo, no computer, no robot could ever do what Mary Knowles does, ever. Because, um, 
this idea of mechanized surveillance is entirely retroactive and is necessarily punitive. It, it doesn't have empathy. And so I think we put empathy at the centre of our vision um, of the good society. That would be uh, a very good thing. All right, I've got more to say, but I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.